here's an outline of what we're going to try and cover in the next hour or so. I know some of this is gobbledygook, so we're going to try and demystify it as much as we can. Uh, we're going to try and focus on what I call news you can use, um, so things that we've been learning from each other in terms of the medical things, the educational challenges, some of those things that come up. Um, and then I'm going to try and teach you just a tiny bit about the biology, about what's going on with this gene uh, that's in your children or in your family members. Uh, and importantly, look towards the future. I will warn you that this is in an exciting way, the first time we're all coming together as a group and as a community. I'm sure it's not going to be the last time, at least it won't be if, it's, if I have anything to do with it. Um, but as we're doing it, we are at the very beginning of our journey. And so one of the things that we as your doctors, that we as your scientists trying to learn about this, we're actually listening to you for what your questions are, what you're observing. Uh, you are all in this with us. So we need to hear from you. What are your priorities? What are the greatest challenges? Where should we be putting our efforts as we do this? So we're going to be taking lots of notes. You'll see lots of us with uh, paper and pencil as we're talking to you, jotting down what some of these things are to focus on. Um, I am going to cover just a tiny bit because people always ask me about gene therapy. You've even seen it potentially in the news this last week about even editing genes within embryos. Um, so I'm going to give just a little bit of information about that. And then, as I said, we're going to try and make this whole weekend a conversation about asking and answering questions as much as we can. So as we're going through, um, our genetic information is enormously complex. It is made up of three billion alphabet letters. And of that, for many of your children or your family members, there is one single letter, one single typo, one single change that is responsible for the differences that you're seeing. I'm not going to go into tons of detail about this, uh, but for most of, I think all of you that I know of, in fact, this was something that happened brand new in your child. So in other words, it was not something passed down from either one of you as parents or for those of you grandparents. It was not something that got brought down in the family. It was something that started brand new in your child or your grandchild. Uh, just so you know, this happens to all of us when we have children. We're humans. We're not perfect. We don't make perfect children. We ourselves are not perfect. I can tell you from looking at my two sons, my two sons actually have about 70 to 80 different spots within their three billion letters that are different from me or from my husband. So it happens in every one of our children. The difference in your child or your grandchild's was that one particular spot happened to fall within this gene we're spending the weekend talking about, this PPP2R5D. In other people, in my sons for instance, that particular change has fallen in another spot, a different spot. But just these changes happen, there's nothing, I'm going to speak to the moms now, there's nothing you did that caused this, there's nothing you didn't do that caused this. This was not forgetting to take your prenatal vitamin for a day. This was not the glass of wine you had before you realized you were pregnant. This was nothing under your control. So if any of you are still carrying around guilt, moms or dads, time to get rid of it. There are much more important things to do with that energy, and there was nothing you could have done to change that. And so you should not be concerned that this was something that you could have prevented or you should have done something about. And let's focus our energy towards the future. Okay. When did this happen exactly, the exact moment when it happened? I can't tell actually from the genetic information we have from your children. So most of you have a genetic test report that you got from someone, one of your doctors, one of your healthcare providers, that, and I'll go into the detail, that tells exactly what the spelling typo is. But from that alone, I can't tell, was it in the egg, was it in the sperm, was it after those two got together and started developing into your child? I don't know, and I can't know from the information we have so far, but it doesn't really matter so much. Don't worry about it, except if you're thinking about having more children. So for some of you that have younger children, as an example, you may be asking yourself, if I have another child, is this going to happen again? The easy answer to that is it's not likely, but there is about a 1% chance that it could happen again. It's not a large percentage, but it's about 1%. In my experience, what most families do with that information, if they're concerned, is they will conceive naturally. They'll get pregnant the natural, old-fashioned way, but if they're really concerned about it, once they are pregnant, they'll have something where they can do a test on the developing fetus, something that we call an amniocentesis or a chorionic villus sampling, just to be 100% sure that it's not the 1%. 
right? Now, some people feel very comfortable with that. If there are people that want to go deeply into that and ask more information, we've got Megan Cho, who's actually here. I'll let Megan raise her hand. She's actually one of the genetic counselors here, and we've got a whole team of those of us, either as geneticists or genetic counselors, who'll be glad to go deeper and ask, answer any questions. And you can ask them on the panel discussion. But in general, don't lose any sleep that it's going to be something you're going to have a big concern about. For those of you who have other children or have brothers and sisters and you're asking what is their risk, does anyone else in the family have to worry about this, the answer besides the two of you, the mother and the father in this picture here, beyond the mom and the dad of the child with PPP, the rest of your family does not have to worry about this. So if you have other children and you're worried when they grow up and they have their own children, is this something they're going to have to worry about in their kids, the answer is no. It's not going to skip a generation. It's not something that you have to worry about for them. We're really focusing our energy on your child with PPP this weekend. OK? OK. So let me go on from there. Many of you have looked at your genetic test reports, and it looks like absolute gobbledygook. I understand. That's OK. There's usually what I call an executive summary, a box that we put around that says, this is where to focus your energy. For those of you, I'll get into it in a second, who have been in Simon's VIP, we've actually looked to this to make sure you're actually in the right club. Believe it or not, sometimes there's confusion and you don't get into the right club, and so we try and redirect you to make sure you're going to the right place. Um, for those of you, very specifically, who have this change, if you look in that box on your test report and you see PPP2R5D and you see E198K, that's the majority, not every single one of you this, that are in this room, but the majority, the most that we see in terms of the specific type of change is that one particular change. I've put up here um, all the other different mutations, not for everyone in the PPP community, but for all of the ones that we've actually reviewed your genetic test reports, so we know that we can say that we've seen it with our own eyes. These are the different changes that we've seen. And you'll see that there are some that are less frequent that we see within the room here today. Um, one of the things that we as scientists are going to be doing is actually looking to see do all of these different changes act the same way. Are there differences? Are they the same? The one thing I can be very confident of at this point is the E198K is definitely something that we're consistently seeing. From a statistical point of view, it's not just a fluke that we're seeing this in so many of your children. So that I think we're quite confident of. For some of these others, we're more or less confident and we're still learning. And that's part of, as I said, we're at the beginning of this process in terms of learning what this does. If you want to drill down into any specifics, we'll be glad to do this. But one of the things I think we're particularly interested in is what are the things that are the same across all of our individuals here and what are the things that are different and are they related to some of these differences we see that's in the exact change in PPP. So it may be, and I'm, I'm learning with you too, it may be that some of you have challenges that are very specific and they might even be specific to one of the changes and I think there are probably going to be challenges that we all share. Okay. So that's part of what we're going to be learning. Now, I have to commend you. You guys are amazing. Um, we put the word out in terms of being able to gather the information so that we'd have it in time to be able to present back to you. And what I'm going to be telling you about is that information. There are 26 of you who registered at Simon's VIP. There are 14 of you that got to the point of talking with Ashley Wilson, who's a genetic counselor who works with me, who wishes she could be here. She sends her regards, but she had to go to Canada so they wouldn't kick her out of the country here in the United States because she's a Canadian citizen. Um, so, but this is from all the information that you provided. Um, and one of the important things, and I know you know from talking with each other last night and starting to meet, we have children, or we have not children even, we have individuals across a wide range of ages, which is wonderful. So we have everyone from the little ones who are still toddlers, so we have adults who are up to 25 years old, um, and we're learning from each other. And I know some of you are going to be with younger children or going to be looking to the adolescents and the young adults uh, to try and get an idea of what's coming forward. You'll notice that we see both males and females with this. This is an equal opportunity gene. It's not just girls. It's not just boys. We see it equally within uh, the community. So these are, and, and some of you will actually recognize some of the individuals um, in this. This is all something, by the way, that people gave permission for, so I haven't done anything with anyone's permission. Um, but these are all individuals who are published um, in the literature, so as doctors, 
as scientists. Um, this has been, thank you for those of you who are willing to share some very personal photos, uh, because the very good thing is it helps other doctors to be able to recognize what this looks like. And that's part of what we want to be able to do, um, is I should say that although all of you are here, for every one of you that's here, I am absolutely positive there's at least 100 of you who aren't here. Right, so I know that this is very under-recognized. We are just starting to get to the point of realizing how common this is. And I will give you a preview. One of the things that I think is very important is that we figure out who all of our membership is within this club because we need to be able to be a popular club so that we can both learn as well as so that we can be able to help each other as we're going through. So thank you for those of you, as I said, who are willing to share. I think you probably recognize in some of your children that they have some facial features that are a little bit different when you take a family photo that may be different from your other children or from each of you as parents. Um, that Those are some of the differences that we see. I'll be very honest that if you were to go, if I were to meet you at the playground or meet you at the park, don't be self-conscious about it. When I've asked other people, they don't necessarily, it's not something that they focus on or immediately obvious. Your children are absolutely gorgeous, so it's something you should not be self-conscious about. But just so you know, if some of the doctors tell you, there are some things for those of us who obsess about this that are a little bit different. But it's nothing to be worried about. It's nothing um, that's not something that they're not still gorgeous angels in terms of uh, your children. So I'm going to delve into some of the medical information, and I do this very specifically because some of you are worried about what should I be doing? What should I be telling my doctors? Um, are there things that I should be concerned about? So items one, two, and three for you to worry about are actually not what I think of as primarily medical problems, but they're really more issues or differences that have to do with the brain and how the brain is functioning and how your children are learning and how they're developing from the brain's point of view. We know that everyone that has this condition has some sort of brain challenges. So they have some sort of differences. And I know you've observed this. The age at which they first uh, walk, for instance, is later. The way that they learn, it takes longer. It takes more repetition. It takes more reinforcement. Um, so these are things that we all know, and we put under the category of developmental delay. That's oftentimes a label we will use for young children, and you'll hear the terminology change as children get older, and we're, we're more certain of exactly how their brains are functioning. You'll hear the term intellectual disability. Um, it is something that we work on very hard. I know you guys work on it every single day, um, but it is the thing that is most characteristic and most consistent that we see across our individuals. For many of them, I challenge you, I know there's a lot going up here that they can't always tell us about, right? Language and expressing themselves is particularly challenging, and you can only imagine how frustrating it is for them not to be able to get the words out and to be able to communicate with you. Um, I, am, this is, I am not a speech pathologist, but I can tell you just from my own observations, we have amazing new technologies to be able to be their voices for them in many cases. And so uh, I would urge you, I would pressure your therapist that you're working with, your speech and language pathologist, to use assisted communication devices. Many of these are as simple as iPads that have very specific communication modalities, but absolutely do not let your children be frustrated with not being able to communicate. And we can talk about these in some of the panel discussions if people have questions, but one of my themes for the weekend is going to be there is incredible technology that helps us fill some of those gaps. Some of the things that they can't do for themselves, we can support them to be able to do. Some of the individuals, not all, but some of the individuals also have an official diagnosis of autism. And for some of the children that don't have an official diagnosis of autism, they have some of the features that are shared with autism. All of them, again, have some challenges in terms of the brain, but what I mean by autism is that some of them have, for instance, the characteristic features we see with that. They need consistency. If things get out of their routine, it's disruptive to them. It makes them nervous, and sometimes they have tantrums or they have meltdowns. 
Sometimes they have things where they tend to repeat things. They tend to do the same thing over and over again. We call these sometimes stereotypical behaviors. They have difficulty with language, one of the things we were just talking about. I actually find that they don't have so much difficulty in terms of the social aspect, many of them. Many of them are wonderfully loving, they're very open, but some of them do get nervous when they're in new situations with new people, and that can be challenging. And those are some of the ways that we see that they overlap in, term of their, in terms of their behaviors with autism. Some of them, you'll notice, have difficulty with movement. They're, not, they're a little clumsy. They're not the most coordinated, and we will officially say that that's a developmental coordination disorder in some cases, and all of them, I would say, by the time they get to the point of being in school, do have some learning challenges, um, but in this, we had one individual diagnosed officially with a learning disability. That's the most consistent. Now what I'm going to show you about are some things that are less consistent. And the good news about this that I should say um, is that, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, I have not seen anyone that has regressed. So what I mean by that from a developmental point of view is everything continues to go forward with their development. It is slower for sure, but I haven't seen anyone that has taken a step backwards and lost ability to do things once they have really gained that skill. I understand it takes a lot of time, a lot of reinforcement, it doesn't happen right away, but the good thing is that I have not seen this so far in terms of being a degenerative condition or a regression, okay? Anyone tell me if they see anything differently, but at least so far in terms of what I've seen, that's what we've seen. So starting from the time the children are itty bitty, um, for the most part they've been doing, uh, they've had some challenges that we've seen early on. Um, again, these were your reports to us out of the 14 individuals that we have the information for. Some of them were in the neonatal intensive care unit. We did have two of them that had seizures, uh, even when they were newborns, and a few of them in a short term way had some breathing problems. Not long term, short term when they were little. Um, many of you noticed there was something different, I would say, for the moms almost immediately out of the chute, um, especially we've noticed for mothers who've had other children and had something by comparison. Some of the things that I think you probably noticed um, were that the tone was different. They were a little bit floppier, a little bit looser. They weren't quite as strong. Um, for many of you that breastfed, they didn't necessarily latch on. They didn't suck quite as easily, quite as quickly took a little more, even for those of you that were bottle feeding in some cases, for them to get the coordination in terms of the eating. So those were some of the things that we saw. Um, the other thing that some of you have told us is that just the temperament for the babies was a little bit different. They were a little bit more irritable, um, and some of them were a little bit more sleepy or lethargic. Um, and again, you guys tell me, you were the ones who were there, um, but those were some of the observations that we had. And I always say to trust uh, parents' instincts, um, you were, you in this room, you had that instinct and you were pushing your doctors in many cases to come up and answer the question of why. Why is my child different? Um, and that's why you're here today. For these things, when we actually look at your children, what we see from our point of view, the neurologic or the brain things that we see are different are exactly what I just talked about. We call it hypotonia or low muscle tone. We basically saw that in every single one of the individuals. A few of you, your children also, and I know this sounds a little bit unusual, but also had parts of your body or parts of their body that were hypertonic, where they actually had high muscle tone. The therapist, your physical therapist, I'm sure have been working on this. High muscle tone, we like to make sure that we don't get contractures so that we have the appropriate relaxation. And for hypotonia, your therapists are doing exercises with you to increase that core strength. And so that's one of the things that uh, you continue to work on. This doesn't cause any problems, but when we actually do measurements of the head size, we notice that most individuals actually have a relatively larger head size. It's not something to be concerned about. It's not that there's water on the brain. It's not that they have a condition 
called hydrocephalus or water on the brain. They do not have that. There's nothing that we need to do about it in terms of surgery or anything else. But I just want you to know, because sometimes someone will make a comment like, oh my goodness, this is a larger head size. And you say, yeah, we know about that. That's part of, this is one of the things that we see with this condition. So don't get alarmed, don't get nervous. Just need to buy a slightly larger baseball cap when you go to the baseball game. With this, we also see, as I said, some folks that are a little bit clumsier. They're not quite as coordinated. The one thing to be careful about just from a safety point of view are things like, for instance, stairs or other things in terms of on the playground, on the jungle gym, um, just as a safety point of view. But kids learn to be able to accommodate and certainly parents learn about this as well. One of the things that I do want you to be attuned to is that not everyone but many of you, at least to me, more than average, have noted seizures or epilepsy. Again, it's not been consistent for everyone, but the reason I alert you to this is that if there are seizures, it's important to recognize them and it's important to treat them. If the seizures don't get treated, it's as if you're in a thunderstorm, a brain fog all the time because that electrical activity is going on constantly and it's harder for your children to learn and for their brains to develop. So if you are seeing anything that you're concerned about, if you're seeing jerking movements, that's what we see with something that we call a tonic-clonic seizure. If you're seeing something where it looks like your kids are spaced out, sometimes all of us space out and we daydream. But if you look at your child, they are spacing out and you can't bring them back to be able to come back to you and they look like they're out of it, then what I want you to do is actually, if you have a phone that can take a video, if you remember, Take a video clip of that and show your doctor. Whether it's your pediatrician, your neurologist, it is really, really helpful if we can see what you're seeing. And if your doctor is concerned that it might be a seizure, what they will often do is bring you in or bring your child in to do an EEG, an electroencephalogram. They'll put a bunch of what they call leads, a bunch of electrical wires onto the brain so that we can actually see what the brain electrical activity is. And especially if you do this as an overnight activity in the hospital, they will hook up a video camera at the same time we have the EEGs on the head. And so that way we can see on the video what you're seeing and correlate it with the electrical activity in the brain at the same time. Now sometimes what we see when we do that is that you see something that you're concerned about. You see some of the movements or you see some of the spacing out and we look at the brain waves at the same time and we say, no, nah, we don't see anything. That's just a behavior, that's just what your child does, but it is not a seizure. On the other hand, if you're concerned, oftentimes I'll have you click a button and you're seeing something and we see something on the video and at the same time the electrical activity is going a little nuts, then we know that that may be a seizure that needs to have treatment with medication. The medications can be very effective, so don't be afraid of them if you need to have them, but it's important to get treatment if there are seizures, okay? Not everyone has a seizure, and one of the things you'll notice here is that one of our kiddos had what we call a febrile seizure or a seizure associated with a fever those types of seizures don't always need to be treated with medications long term. That can be something that just in that instance, with that infection, with that fever was a one-time thing. But it's important, again, for you to get this checked out by your doctors, okay? Some of the other things I want you to be very aware of, and I know most of you are, is that for the brain to learn, it needs to be getting information coming in. How do we get information about our world? Well, we see things, we hear things, we feel things, we taste things. The two biggest senses to be able to do this are our eyes and our ears. And if we can't perceive the world, if we can't take in that information accurately, it's hard for our brain to learn. So the thing that I wanna make sure is that our kiddos actually have eyes that are working as best as they can and ears that are working as best as they can so that they can be learning from every, oops, excuse me, from everything around them. So some of the things that you have noticed are that some of the children have had a lazy eye. 
One of the eyes has been a little bit weaker, may have deviated or gone out to the outside or to the inside. This is something that if we need to align the eyes so that both of the eyes are looking forward and, and focusing, sometimes we need to do a surgery to be able to tighten up one of those eye muscles. That's something that sometimes, just with therapy, with uh, some of the things we can do with vision therapy, we can actually strengthen that muscle. But we do want to make sure the eyes are aligned and focused and looking in the same direction together. Sometimes you'll notice that an eye may sort of uh, be a little bit wiggly, go a little bit side to side, and that's something we call nystagmus. That's not something that we usually need to treat, but just in case you see a fluttering of the eye, that's what we see. Some of the children need to have glasses. I need to have glasses. A lot of us need to have glasses. So some of them, usually it's because they're having trouble seeing far away. And it's tough, I have to admit, to be able to see if a child needs glasses because they can't read that letter chart, right? When you and I go into the eye doctor and we read A, Z, F, our kiddos can't do that. And so it's important to get a good pediatric or child ophthalmologist that can do a good eye exam without having to be able to have your child give a lot of feedback or information. As they're doing that, they may need to have spectacles, they may need to have glasses, and I have to admit, a lot of kids don't like to wear the glasses, so it is something that's a challenge, I know. But important, again, to make sure they're seeing the world the way we're seeing the world. For one child, there was actually trouble with vision that wasn't in the eyes itself, but it's what we call cortical blindness. So the part of the brain in the back of the head that connects with the eyes and actually registers what's being said, we did have one of our, our individuals who had problems that it was more in the brain part of things rather than the eye part of things. And that's a little bit more difficult to be able to uh, meet or to be able to fix that. Some of the other things that many of you notice that we, I have to say I see quite commonly are intestinal things or tummy problems. Um, so they're problems that can be everything from constipation, not pooping very regularly, or having trouble being able to poop, um, to reflux or heartburn. And for those of you who know when we eat something that doesn't quite agree with us, you know, how annoying that can be or how um, much that can feel not so great that night. Um, that's sometimes what our kids are feeling on a more constant basis. So in the same way that their muscle tone is low with their arms or their legs, their muscle tone in their intestine is actually low as well. And so your intestine is constantly squeezing to be able to move things along. If it's not as strong, if it's not squeezing as hard, things go through more slowly. And that's what the constipation is. In some cases, there's a something that keeps the food from coming back up, right? There's a, a particular muscle that keeps things from coming back up so you don't vomit or you don't have reflux or indigestion. Again, for our children, that muscle tone is not quite as strong. And so being able to prevent things from coming back up doesn't work so well with them. So they can get acid reflux, they can get heartburn. And again, there are medications that can help them either to keep that from that burning sensation that they often have or to help things keep moving along in terms of the, the constipation. We can talk about it later if you like, but there are lots of ways to treating this, um, things that don't require medications for things of you that would rather not give your children medications, uh, things that are things like prune juice or other fibers that can be able to make them more regular. Um, but there are also some of the children that have quite the opposite, that have diarrhea. Um, I expect that many of you actually have some very good tips in terms of what diets have been most effective for that, um, and that's one of the things I think we can share this weekend. In terms of infections, to my knowledge, none of our individuals have had full-blown immuno immunodeficiencies. So no one's actually had a real problem with their immune system, but one of the things to make you aware of is that many of them have ear infections. And again, remember what I said, I want the eyes to work, I want the ears to work, and if you're having a lot of ear infections, for those of you who have been swimming this summer, if you get under the water, how well do you hear if someone's talking to you when you're under the water? At least I can tell you, I don't hear so well, right? If I've got water in my ears, um, even if I get out of the pool and I've got water in my ears, I can't hear you very well, I can't understand. Many people, when they get an ear infection, they get fluid building up within the middle ear here. And it's the same way. 
Your kids, if they have an ear infection, can't hear clearly, and as they can't hear clearly, their part of the brain that's learning language is not learning very well. And so again, we may need to put tubes in their ears, we may need to use antibiotics to clear those ear infections, but I am more aggressive about taking most of those measures with my kids that have developmental disabilities because I don't want them to continue having those types of problems. Doesn't mean at the first ear infection you have to put tubes in the ears, but if it's a continued problem, I am concerned about that. Again, some of our folks um, have trouble just when they do get an infection. It takes them a little bit longer to get over the infection. But in general, we've been finding they do get over those infections. Um, and in the same way, when it came to breathing issues, I would say they have sort of the average amount of asthma, the average amount of bronchitis, but not a specific lung problem. The biggest challenge is just when they're sick, they can't tell you what's bothering them as well. You know they're off, you know they're not having a good day, but it's a little bit more challenging to figure out what's going on. The good news is that there aren't a lot of other problems. We had one individual within our series that was born with a hole in the heart, only one out of 14, so that's not incredibly common, and it was something that was fixed. Um, we had one individual that had a birth defect that was born with one kidney, so rather than having two kidneys back here, they were born with just one. The good news is one works perfectly fine. You just don't have a backup generator. Um, but with that, uh, there are no you know, specific things to do about that, except we do make sure that that one kidney continues to work well. And we did notice that certain individuals had some problems with growth. Not any problems that I would say were catastrophic, but we did notice that being on the shorter side compared to brothers or sisters or sometimes parents was not unusual. Um, there was one child that was diagnosed with a specific growth hormone deficiency. And again, if there is a specific growth hormone deficiency, that can be treated with the medication growth hormone. Does everyone need to have growth hormone? I personally think probably not. Um, it is a medication that's an injectable medication, so it's not so pleasant to be able to do, but it will work in terms of giving some additional height, and it does work as well in terms of increasing core strength. But it's, again, not something that I would necessarily say everyone should run out and do growth hormone therapy. It is, I think, a, a tough medication in terms of being able to use. Um, for some of the individuals, there were things with the bones. Um, the thing that I want you to pay the most attention to is curvature of the spine or scoliosis. Many individuals where their core muscle tone is low, as they go through puberty specifically, so as they're going through adolescence and they're growing rapidly, that's when we often see the scoliosis or the curvature of the spine come out. So if your children are still younger, if they haven't yet gone through puberty, one of the things I want you to keep in the back of your mind is to make sure they're checking for that. Again, it's something that can be fixed, either with bracing or if really, really necessary for surgery, uh, but it's important to keep them healthy overall. When we went through to see what types of surgeries our kiddos were having, the things that we sometimes saw were gastrostomy tubes. Um, and again, these were problems because remember I said the babies were having trouble feeding. Um, some of the ones that were having more severe trouble feeding and growing needed us to help in terms of feeding them. Gastrostomy tubes don't necessarily stay around forever. Once children get old enough, if they don't continue to need them, they can be taken out. As I was saying, some of the kiddos needed to have ear tubes put in because they were having ear infections and those worked quite effectively. And then there were some, what I consider some of the more common pediatric things, um, having your tonsils out, uh, having a hernia, and then as I said, the one baby that was born with a hole in the heart. Some of the other things that are not I don't think big deals. Some of the kids had eczema. So some children um, will have kind of this rash that sometimes uh, gets more pronounced in the winter time. Not a big deal, but some of them had it. And when we looked at the medications that kiddos were taking, in general, they were things that had to do either with the seizures or with the behavioral or sleep problems. Sleep, I know, can be a tough thing, both for your child as well as for the family. I can tell you when I got in at three o'clock this morning, sleep was a big thing for me. So getting a good night's sleep is very good in terms of helping your child to learn, as well as dealing with some of the behavioral issues that come up. And so we can certainly talk about it more, but uh, things like melatonin are an easy way to start in terms of a medication that may be helpful. And for folks that need to have some more powerful medications, there are more powerful medications that can help long-term. 
And then this heartburn or reflux was one of the other issues that we saw. So just putting it all together, and I'm gonna finish with the medical part of things here. Um, the things that we were mainly seeing are, to be honest, I'm gonna summarize this as, what you see is what you get. So I, I don't mean to be pejorative about this, but what I mean is that what you've experienced is probably what you're going to be experiencing. I doubt most of you, by the time you are now, are gonna have any big, big surprises about new things coming up. So I think there are gonna be continued things we'll have to do to support um, in terms of development and brain function. But for the most part, I think you've probably seen them. One of the things I don't know yet about that, so this is the one thing to ask you all about, is are we going to see any time where seizures come up other than in the newborn period? And this is a question I have for you all, just as we see our children growing. Sometimes I see an increased frequency of seizures in adolescence. We don't have as many folks that are young adults to be have gone through that, so that's one of the questions I have for you all. Um, but otherwise, my guess is for most of the other medical things, we will have seen most of it. I don't mean to concern you, but I do want you to pay attention, and if you see this, I want you to let us know right away. This is a gene that has been implicated in cancer before. To my knowledge, no one in our community has had a cancer, but on the other hand, our, many of our children are still young. I don't wanna frighten you about it. There's nothing specifically that I have to do, but it is something that I want to get feedback very quickly because it's something, when I think about the health of our community, it's one of the things that is a theoretical possibility. And so I just want you to be aware of that and be able to talk amongst the community if there is something that comes up. Otherwise, for the most part, these things, as I said, medically, the body itself, the rest of the body from the neck down generally is working pretty well. The issue that we're gonna be focusing in terms of support is really up here from the shoulders above. Okay, so this is one slide that I'm not gonna go into much detail on. Um, for those of you who would like, or have your PhD in biology, molecular biology, we'll have the advanced course tonight over cocktails. Uh, but for this is what this particular gene does. Richard, I'm gonna let you actually wave your hand. One of our gurus, one of our scientists who's joined us uh, actually is an expert within this and, and some of the other related uh, ways that our, our cells work. This is a, a, what we call a phosphatase. And if you don't understand any of this, don't worry about it, it really doesn't matter so much. But the point is, is that this is a gene that we know is related to the way cells grow and being able to control cells growing. At least one of the things that I think is related to the large head size is because the brain was actually growing. The cells in the brain, the neurons that make up the brain were actually growing a little bit more and that accounts for why the head size is larger. I can't definitively 100% say that's true right now, but that's my hypothesis in terms of what's going on. The reason I brought in cancer is because, again, cells that are growing when they're not supposed to be growing are essentially what cancer is. And so there's a theoretical connection between specifically what this gene does, one of the manifestations we've seen, at least in terms of the brain, and a theoretical connection to other things that could happen in the future. So I hope this isn't something that we have to worry about, but it is a theoretical possible connection that we see. One of the things that at least some of us at Scientifically are also trying to figure out is how this community, our club here, might relate to some of the other genes that are also phosphatases, but that are slightly different from PPP to R5D. And so there are other phosphatases, and this is just for those of you who are interested, some of the pictures. I don't think the children look exactly the same as our group does here, but there are some facial differences, and there are an emerging number of other phosphatases that are associated with similar sort of challenges. The reason I bring this up is because within the community of rare diseases, numbers matter. And so to the extent that we can actually make this community a little bit larger in one dimension or another, it will actually serve us well in the end, I think, to be able to get more scientists, more biologists, more people who work on treatment, if they can think about how to do this not just for one condition, but for a group of related conditions. So I'm not gonna talk any more about this because it's not directly relevant to our group here, but just to realize there are other sort of parallel groups going on with communities forming around the world. 
Um, again, you'll have these slides if you need them. These are the other phosphatases, the other ones that are related. And if you take the time to go through and look at these, there are some things that are similar and some things that are different, but really above the shoulders is where I think we meet and where we have common, uh, common challenges. So many of you are appropriately thinking to yourselves, well, that's great. How are we going to be able to come up with a treatment for this? How are we going to be able to now uh, take this information? We've got the gene. We know it's a phosphatase. Fix it. Let's just make this all better, and then we can go home, right? So I wish it were that easy. I just want to be a little bit of a reality check to understand that you have a huge community of people behind you. But for another condition that's called cystic fibrosis, one particular gene that we knew about, actually, let me go back and show you. So we knew about the gene actually, uh, let's see, uh, back here in 1989. So already, gosh, almost 28 years ago. Um, with that, it took until 2012 to be able to get an FDA approved medication for that. Now the good thing is science has progressed enormously faster over the last 30 years, and so we are much faster, much better at being able to develop new treatments, and so I think that time is compressed. There's another condition that I've worked on called spinal muscular atrophy, and we definitely hugely compress that time from understanding the gene to be able to come up with a treatment, but I will warn you these things do not happen overnight. We are at the very, very beginning of our understanding. You guys as a community have been committed to this, and we on the scientific and medical side are also equally committed to being able to push this forward. But there are so many questions that we have that I just want to emphasize we're at the very beginning of this journey that we're going through. Now, some of you would say, well, the easiest way of solving this problem is you know what the gene is. You showed us that nice table says all the different changes, just fix it, right? Just edit it. We've heard about this gene editing. We've heard about this CRISPR. Just take your little molecular scissors, just cut out the one that's not the one we want, just sew in the one that's the good one, and we're done, right? And in an ideal world, in fact, that would be exactly right. We would like to be able to do that. One of the things I will reassure you is the current technology that we have for gene editing or gene therapy is enormously better than what we had five years ago. That was one of those things that I said is a remarkable improvement in how we can do this. And so we can now, in fact, in the laboratory, in my laboratory, every day we do gene editing. We don't do it on people. We do it on cells from people in the laboratory, but we don't do it in living people at this point. And the reason for that is because we want to be very, very sure that if we are going to do anything to people, it's safe. And we learned our lesson as a genetics community. In the days of gene therapy, there was a young man that was actually at the University of Pennsylvania, and he actually had gene therapy for a condition called OTC deficiency, and he died of his gene therapy. Within a few days after he got the infusion for that, he actually died from an overwhelming infection associated with that. So as a community, one of the things we've learned is that we need to be careful we need to go through the proper steps of safety, and that includes many steps from starting with cells in a dish to being able to do it on little four-footed furry creatures, little mice that we do, eventually being able to do this in larger things like pigs or cows or sheep, eventually being able to do it in what we call non-human primates or monkeys, and then and only then when we know things are safe and effective do we do them in people. So as you can imagine from everything I just said, that's many, many steps that it takes to be able to do that. So even though very technically I could tell you if I took cells from you, and for some of you that's what we're going to be doing this weekend is taking blood cells, we could in the laboratory go in and we could use our molecular scissors. We could go through, let me just show you one of these things. We could go through, we could snip out that one letter that we need to snip out. We could put in the one letter that needs to be put in. We could absolutely fix that gene in cells in the laboratory. But we need to be careful because when you do this, one of the things we've learned from other gene therapy is sometimes you can accidentally, without even knowing it, in some place else, snip out another gene, snip out another letter, and put in another letter that you didn't even realize. It's like having collateral damage. And so one of the things we need to be very careful about is making sure that we've snipped here 
and we haven't inadvertently snipped or changed anything over here. For other children that went through gene therapy in the earlier days, they actually ultimately developed cancer because of con sort of complications of what happened with the gene therapy, that it activated a cancer gene that people didn't intend for it to do. So again, because of some of those past experiences, we want to make sure that we're very careful, we're slow and deliberate and safe about anything that we do. So as we do this, it takes many steps. On the other hand, as I said, and this is some of the hope in terms of for cystic fibrosis, uh, although it took a long time to be able to do that, I can now say that most individuals with cystic fibrosis do have an effective therapy. And after the first drug was approved, it took less and less time for the second drug to be approved, and now the third drug to be approved. And so this accelerates. Once you get some basic, fundamental understanding of how the gene is working and how it's affecting the brain and the body, you can make a lot of forward progress. So we're gonna have to do some investments to understand how that the mechanism of how this is functioning, how this is working. We're gonna ask as a community your patient, because this won't happen overnight, but once we understand some of those fundamental things and get some of the resources the scientific community needs, I am sure it's going to be faster. So what can you do to help make this happen? If you say that this is something that beyond what we can do in terms of the supports for today, looking for brighter futures tomorrow, what can we do together to make this happen? Well, you've started today, and I again want to acknowledge Carol and Joe and the whole team. I have to say they have a huge, wonderful team of energetic, enthusiastic, dedicated uh, people working behind the scenes. Part of it is just coming together as a community and learning as much as we can for the care for today until we get to a cure for tomorrow, right? We need to be able to do what we can to keep our children healthy, happy, learning, and prepared so that as better ways are available in the future, they are ready for them as well. Part of this is sharing best practices. So it's learning informally from each other. And one of the things I hope that as we have enough information, we can come up with something that might be, for instance, a clinical care guideline for the families with PPP that we can be able to give you to give back to your doctors to say these are the things that we recommend that you do. This is the standard of care that we hope that all individuals with PPP to our 5 d are getting. As we're doing this, that's the reason why we've tortured you. <laughs> and I apologize for this. I hope it hasn't been too much torture. But that's why we've gone to actually ask you for those genetic test reports. We want to make sure everyone that's doing this is in the right club, that we're getting together the right information. That's why we have Ashley go through with you so very carefully in terms of what the medical issues have been. Sometimes we've reviewed your medical records because we want to make sure that if we're coming up with recommendations for the community, that it's based on very good medical and scientific evidence. So apologies, I hope it wasn't too much torture, uh, but we've done that and I will warn you, we would like to come back to everyone in the community on an annual basis, year after year, because we don't know how this is going to be, especially for large numbers of individuals going through puberty, going through adolescence, and going into young adults. And so this is still, we're still learning and we need to be able to share that information. Another thing that many of you are going to be doing today, or rather today and through the rest of the weekend, and I thank you for so much for doing this, is actually being uh, able to give a part of yourselves or a part of your family. And so many of you are giving blood samples. There may be some of you at some point in the future that will also give us some skin samples, and that's to be able to do uh, what I'll get to in just a second. But those are some of the things that can be quite helpful. As we're going through this, uh, we also need to be able to increase the size of our club. Um, you may like being very elite and being very special. You are all incredibly special, but I'd like to see all of those hundred other families that are out there for every one of us here. I'd like to get all of them into the club as well. And so there are a lot of things that we're doing to try and uh, do that. I'll just jump ahead to one of these things. Um, if in your communities you know anyone who has autism, we have a program at, uh, that I run, uh, also with Jennifer Chernagel, who's in the back, that's called Simons Foundation Powering Autism Research for Knowledge, called SPARK. You guys, you don't have to worry about this so much because you already have a diagnosis, you have the information, but for families who cannot get access to the genetic testing that you had access to to get you into the club, 
This is a way for them, if they live in the United States, to be able to get access to that type of genetic testing for free. It costs nothing for them. They can do it from their home. We ask them to spit into a cup to be able to get the genetic uh, material that we need to do for the testing, and we return that information to them if they have the PPP to our 5D. And so again, for this group in this room, you don't need this, but it is something that we want to be able to make sure that other people can get into our club. And also, if they can go through their regular doctor and get it through the same way that you did, that is wonderful and even better, I would say, because then they're doing it within the context of their, their medical system and their doctors. So those are the things that will be able to get our club to the right size that it needs. Part of the reason I say that, and I'm just being very, very blunt and honest about this, is that when researchers go to try and get funding to be able to do the research, Joe has done a fabulous job of getting funding by raising funding, but sometimes we also need additional funds that come from the government through agencies like the National Institutes of Health, or for some of you that are in other countries, through other funding agencies in other countries. And you can imagine that sometimes people decide how to allocate funds for that based on how common the condition is. And so you can think about, for instance, Alzheimer's gets a lot more funding dollars than PPP2R5D does from the National Institutes of Health because they vote with the frequency. If we can show that this is a more common condition, it's likely that it will get more funds that flow to this condition. As we do this, we will need to develop, as I said, the reagents or the, the, the tools that scientists need to be able to study this. Um, the group here, Jordan's Guardian Angels, has been very, and I, I have to give a lot of credit, as I said, to the scientific group that is leading this. I think all of us are committed to making sure that anything that is generated from this is freely accessible to any qualified investigator in the scientific community. So in other words, this is not about hoarding anything that the families are giving today. This is about sharing with anyone who has a good idea about this in a de-identified way. So let me reassure you, for anyone that has contributed information, either about uh, specific aspects of your child, anyone who's contributed a blood sample or anything else, this information is not known, it is not tagged with your name or your address or your social security number. So we are trying to keep your information confidential. If you are willing to share things like photos, which are obviously identifying, then obviously we encourage that if you're willing to do that, but we will not ask anyone to do anything that they're not comfortable with doing and not comfortable with sharing. As we're doing this, some of the things that we need to be able to do, I think a critical experiment is understanding whether or not we can reverse this. So let me just sort of uh, help you think through this. Uh, a, a scientific question is if your child were, for instance, three years old and I could now do gene therapy at the age of three, would I have lost a window of opportunity to be able to get the brain to work differently? Or is it very effective if I can do it at three? If I do it at three, can I put your child on normal trajectory and get them back to normal? If I can, then that suggests that that would be something that you might want to do. You might want to try gene therapy at the age of three. But I don't yet know scientifically if I have a window of opportunity that goes from zero to 22 years. Does it go zero to 22 months? I have no idea at this point, but I do think it's a very important question because as I said, there are some risks that go with any one of these procedures, and I don't want to expose anyone to risks unless I know that they can benefit from that. And so a very fundamental question I think that we'll want to do as a community is try and address that early on. So how do we do those things? And I don't expect you to memorize this. This is um, something that you can look back later if you want to. One of the things that we can do is actually to be able to make reagents or make things that people, scientists, can use in the laboratory and be able to do this so that we don't have to keep coming back and bugging you. So one of the things we can do, and it kind of blows my mind, is that we can take a blood sample from you and we can actually make that into brain cells in the laboratory. We can even make it into little mini brains called organoids. They're not perfect brains, they not, they're, don't function exactly like our brains do, but they're good models to be able to use so that if, for instance, there's a medication that we want to try and see if it works, 
we can take that medication, sprinkle it on the cells in the dish, and see what the effect is. We don't have to give it to your child. We don't have to shove it down their mouth and see what happens. We can be able to do this, and we can do it not just for one medication, but we can do it for thousands of medications simultaneously. So there are ways of being able to do high throughput drug screens to be able to very quickly go through and see if there are medications, some of which the FDA has already tested and knows they're safe to be able to see if they will work in those brain cells in a dish. One of the reasons why we've actually asked all of you to participate is that when I said before, there's one mutation, one genetic variant that's more common that's one that's going to be easy to be able to study, but all the other ones were onesies. So what I mean by that is there was only one individual that was in the, the uh, group that came together, and for those of you who are the onesies, it's even more important for you guys to give your blood samples. And I'll say that just as a self-serving thing, because if you don't, I don't have someone else to represent you at this point, right? So if you're interested in terms of what you can do for your family, I think it's, I know it's not easy, but we have, uh, actually they've left the room already. Uh, I brought with me from New York two of my very, very finest phlebotomists that do my little tiny babies in the nursery. They are very gentle. They have been doing this for over 15 years and they will do it as gently as they can. And for those of you who would like to have some numbing medicine or emla cream, I also brought some emla cream with me. I will warn you, for you guys, you guys are oftentimes the hardest ones. If you need the Emla cream, I'll give it to you too. Um, but, but we would like to get samples both from our kiddos with PPP, and we would also like to get many of you as parents as controls for comparison, because you will have that difference of PPP that you as parents don't have. In some cases, we can do this and make very effective brain cells from blood, but there are some laboratories that prefer making the brain cells from skin cells. And so some of you, not today, not this weekend, but some of you may go back home, or some of you may see me in New York or see Dr. Mirza in Seattle, um, but you may come back and we may take tiny little snippets of skin to also be able to make into these brain cells. So the reason why we're doing this is again to be able to get a system that we can study in the laboratory. Now, that's nice to do, uh, but a cell in the laboratory is not the same as a brain. Um, and so one of the other things that's going on right now is to be, actual, to be able to make mouse models of this exact PPP to our 5D. Um, my guess is that at the end of the day, it won't be just one mice, but it'll probably be several different mice that will be able to model some of the different changes that we see in many different individuals uh, that are just right next door. Um, and we will be able to answer this question of reversibility. So we actually have ways in the laboratory of turning genes on and turning genes off, flipping the switch at different times. And that's one of the things that I think is gonna be very informative. If we flip the switch at different ages, what happens? We can either flip the switch to turn the good gene on or turn the bad gene on and be able to see exactly what that window is. We also need those four-footed furry creatures because if we get any medications from the cells in the dish, we want to be able to test them in a living creature to see is there any toxicity, is there any problem, is there any problem if we give this to your child that might have problems with the liver or problems with the heart. So we want to be able to see it in a living creature to be able to see does it work and are there any problems with this. And as you start to do those types of experiments, then you get enough confidence to say, yes, it is something safe, yes, it is something that we think is effective, yes, we might be willing to do this as a clinical trial, as something that we would try out in humans. But thinking about the timeline again for that, it takes many steps to be able to do that because the last thing we wanna do is put any one of our children at risk. Okay, so again, I bear your forgiveness uh, in terms of, or not forgiveness, but I, um, patience with us as we try and do this. Uh, we have a team of, I have to tell you, world-class investigators that have been hand-selected because of their experience, specifically with this group of phosphatases. Um, they know exactly what they need to do, and we are now bringing you to the table to be able to, number one, help tell us what the issues are that we should be addressing, and number two, help to be able to get all of these reagents that we need to be able to power them to be effective. So that's what I've got in terms of the introduction, and I'm sorry, I probably went just a little bit over what we wanted to do. Um, but let me stop here and see if there are any burning questions, and then I'll let you sort of let this sink in over coffee, and then we can have a big panel discussion about it. But before I do that, 
burning questions. Go ahead. So the question is, um, you know, we've got a lot of folks with the 198 mutation, but there are a lot of other mutations here. And are we going to be able to come up with a one-size-fits-all, right, in terms of something that will work for everyone? I have a hypothesis. I might be wrong. Um, but the hypothesis is, is that even though the individual changes are different, that at a functional level they have the same effect. I'm not 100% sure that's true. And in particular, for anyone, I'm not singling anyone out, but this one change here, this first change, the arginine 85 difference, may be acting in a different way. And so that's one of the things we're trying to drill down is understand, are each one of these acting exactly the same way, both in terms of what we see in the individual as well as what we see in the laboratory? I don't know the answer for sure. Um, my own, and this is more for my research colleagues here, my guess is in terms of where these are within the protein and the way that they have an effect, probably many of these are acting in the same way, but we don't know for absolutely every one of these what the answer is. If they are acting generally in the same way, I'm pretty confident that we can come up with either, or if we can come up with it, that it will be a pill that would act effectively on most of the same changes. If it came down to gene editing, the editing would have to be very specific to what the change is. The underlying way of doing it would be exactly the same, but there would be some specificity in terms of exactly where you cut and what you show in. Great question, in the back. Um, when you talked about the SPARC program, I think I heard, heard you say that if they come back with PPP2R5D, then they would let them know. Um, but what if it comes back with anything else other than PPP2R5D? Great point. Um, so I was saying that mainly for the benefit of the community here, but just so that you know, if individuals are in the SPARC program and we identify a genetic cause for their autism that I'm, I, I understand and I interpret as being the cause, I will give them that back as well. So even if they don't go to fit into this club, if they fit into another club, I want them to know about that as well. I have a couple other questions while I have the microphone. Um, Take it away. <laughs> um, is there a universal system that y'all will share all this information with that not only people in the United, uh, geneticists in the United States, but in other countries around the world so that when they start seeing other children presenting with the same stuff that our children are, will they, will they know to look to, to this? So it's a very good question. The idea is um, in terms of transparency and making everyone see the data. Again, our commitment is to be able to allow as many people to see as much information without jeopardizing any of the confidentiality or privacy for any of the individual families, right? So we're very concerned in terms of making sure that you don't feel uncomfortable with the information being distributed. There are several ways that we do this. Um, number one is that, as I said, what we're doing here, we specifically are going to have this information available even for families either who couldn't be here for whatever reason. Uh, if your doctors wanted to be able to see what I'm talking about and get this information, we're making it available to your doctors, your therapists, your teachers, anyone in that way. And then, of course, there's going to be someone Monday morning who's going to be diagnosed with this condition who didn't know to come to this meeting, right? So we're, we're keeping this as a library that will be updated over time as we learn more and we are committed to making that information available. There's something that some of you are part of called Simon's VIP, because you're very important people to us. Um, with Simon's VIP, we will be posting this information. We'll be posting the slide deck. We'll be posting the information from this, so that even if you just want to be able to go back, either if Carol, you know, you can't remember where Carol put that in your inbox or something, it'll always be there as a repository of the information that you can go back to, and we will continue to update that information over time as we learn because this is not going to be the final story within that. From the research community point of view, the other thing is if researchers want to be able to study this, we have, again, at the Simons Foundation, something called a safari program that they can apply to get the information, and we get it out to them very, very quickly if there are other research questions. So we do this so that the burden for you all is minimal. You only have to go through sharing your information one time, and infinite number of people anywhere in the world who are, you know, researchers, they have to be real researchers to do this. They sign uh, something saying that they're not going to try and hunt you down or contact you or anything like that. But then we make that available to as many people as we can get to study PPP to our 5D. Well, how do they know how to find it, though? 
This is something where we need to get the word out. Um, and we try, I can tell you, I try, spend a lot of time doing this, and I can't guarantee that we've got this done perfectly. One of the things that we do, and many of you, as I said, were part of the publications on this, I take my hat off to you to doing that because I can tell you the first big impact was just putting us on in the map by putting us into the medical literature so that people knew that this was a real thing. Um, once they realized it was a real thing, many of the laboratories that do the genetic testing, they realize it's a real thing and they give that information back to families and doctors. So I think we got over the huge first hurdle which is just to make it aware that it's a real thing. Many of you are doing the same thing. I actually think Facebook is amazing in the sense that the new families that get diagnosed with this, they can very quickly Google, they can look on Facebook, and all of a sudden, there you are. So I think it's actually easier to be able to get together and to find each other and to be able to know this is real. But if you can think about other ways, I, I'm open to suggestions. If you can think of other ways through social media, through awareness in terms of communities of people who aren't at the meeting today, other pockets of education, educators, therapists, specific types of doctors. I'm all ears. Whatever we can do to increase awareness is a good thing. So the question is, you know, what's the, uh, we, I, I said we could open this up to other phosphatase groups, other PPPs. Uh, is there any downside to doing that, I think is the question in part. So I actually think there's probably not a downside in the sense that um, treatments will still have to be developed, I think, for each one of the phosphatases to make sure each one is safe and efficacious. Uh, I do think, though, you don't always know where the answer is going to come from. And if an answer comes from the phosphatase down the street and all of a sudden we realize that, then we should try it out. You know, we should be able to learn from that. Um, you know, I guess that it is possible that someone could, you know, have bigger eyes than they could really do and they could, you know, try doing too many things at once and do all of them badly. Yeah, theoretically I can see that as a possibility. From the phosphatases that I know of, this is the biggest club amongst the phosphatases. This is the largest number of families for the PPP2R5D specifically. So I think the only thing that benefits you, because I still think it's going to be top priority just based on numbers, I do think it's going to be a benefit bringing more people under the 10. But, you know, I, I think you have to be able to balance those. We have Hutton's um, stem cells stored, oh. stored at Core Blood. I know I talked about this last night, but um, I didn't know if anybody else did. They, they kind of push it in Houston. It's a big thing for us, to, you know, when, when right. they're born. Right. But I didn't know, would that be of any help in the research or anything? Right. So let me um, explain this a little bit. So many of you, either in your obstetrician's offices or something, may have been asked, you know, do you want to bank the cord blood cells, uh, those stem cells? Some people have, they've, you know, they, you pay a sort of initial fee and then you pay a maintenance fee for the storage for that. The idea was that um, maybe someday you might need those cells to do something like a bone marrow transplant, and so that's why you bank them as an insurance policy. Um, the, insur the annual storage fee is not too expensive. My recommendation at this point would be, now that you've invested the money, keep paying your annual storage fee to do that. There's nothing I know to do of it right now that's going to be effective. For those of you who are like kicking yourselves, oh my gosh, why didn't I save those cord cells? Don't worry about it. We all have stem cells in our body right now. If we needed to go back and get harvest any of those stem cells, we still could. So no one's locked out of this as a possibility. Um, but right now, because it's something that you only you you already made the biggest part of the investment, I'm saying don't throw it away at this point. But truth be told, I don't know exactly what to do with it right now. Um, and like I said, if if we needed to as a community, there are ways to be able to get stem cells out of any one of us at any point in our lives. As it pertains to the stem cells, my my question was, since the stem cells, like if you stored your own, well, for for your child is the PPP present in those cells and would it be just re repeating itself again? Yeah, I so guess. so the idea, so let me just, uh, very good question. I didn't really explain this well enough. So within those stem cells, um, those bank cells are the same PPP problem that are in your blood cells, that are in your brain cells, that are in your heart cells. So it's still there, right? So if you were gonna use it, in theory, the way people think about using it is for instance, could that gene editing that I talked about, could you take those cells, could you take them into the laboratory, could you fix that gene and then put it back in the body, since it's your own cells, but now they're new and improved, could you put it back in the body and potentially use that to fix the body, to heal the body? That's, that's sort of what people are thinking, you know, that's the question people are asking. The problem is right now, if I, even if I could fix those cord blood cells, 
That would fix if there were a blood problem. That would fix a blood problem. I don't have a way right now for that to fix a brain problem. So that's why I'm saying I don't know exactly how to use them either from a therapeutic point of view or for a scientific point of view. But on the other hand, it's something that you only get kind of once in life. So if it costs you 100 bucks a year and you can afford to do that, you know, good to do that. But you're right that I would not take those cells and put those cells unadulterated, unchanged back into the body. That's not going to do me any good. Well, so from a research point of view, that's what I'm trying to think of. Is there, you know, something that we could do only with those stem cells that we couldn't do with some other stem cells? And that's why I'm kind of saying, let me noodle that with, you know, the team that's in the back that I can see them busily talking to each other now.